So I'm coming from, I've just finished my master's at the University of Manchester and I'm actually presenting what I did my master's dissertation in. So everyone's had these wonderful talks about very physical objects within art. Um, what, where I'm coming from is, what if we don't have those aspects? What if we have a, a condition where there's no surviving arts, there's nothing that we can actually identify with the culture? Obviously, art is a very like <coughs> fluid thing that is in most or all cultures. Um, so I was looking at specifically Starkar, um, which is a Mesolithic site, which is really difficult to find any art. So I was thinking more, how do we engage with this and how do we um, bring aspects of art and colour back into a Mesolithic landscape? So um, what I did is I created a term called colourscapes. So the project will be looking at how we use colour to rehumanise the past through these colourscapes, how to identify aspects of colour within the past that are made through human contact, so pigments and dyes, um, building a positive data set. So Mick, Nikki Milner, um, she's very uh, brought this idea of positive data set, sets across. So everyone's talking about, oh, we don't have the pr like this preserved in the archaeological record, so this doesn't mean this. But it's this idea of let's bring all the evidence and then formulate conclusions from it. Um, it's not. It's not. It's, I've got more underneath it. <laughs> Sorry. And um, then we can look at um, things such as colour in nature, because colour is not completely um, secluded to um, to humans. So um, <laughs> is it being weird? No. Sorry, it's my formatting. I'll just make it smaller. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so colour in nature. Um, <laughs> um, also, how we process colour. So, um, colour seen through the, the eyes of ourselves and non-humans. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> um, so, how we process these colours. And then, uh, relating it back to looking at specific art concepts within Mesolithic star car. So, how can we then bring all these different um, aspects from colourscapes into looking at art. Um, so to begin with, what is a colourscape? A colourscape is basically a collaboration of all different elements of the colour within the, the landscape, not necessarily archaeological. So we bring in all elements such as uh, colour within nature, um, how animals present colour and engage with colour, plants, insects, geology, everything, the whole landscape. Um, this is in order to build up a more realistic uh, concept of the past. Um, it's massively inspired by the work of Elliot and Hughes who created Soundscapes, which was absolutely fantastic. And what they did is they tried to bring this real um, uh, concept of sound into the Mesolithic where people could engage with sounds that they experienced. Um, it's really bringing the archaeology to people who, who, who sometimes they can't grasp these ideas of colour and sound within the past. <coughs> How is it made? So, construction of colourscapes are, um, it's basically an assessment of all the different colours in order to create a data set which is able to give you all these different variables. So the assessment of the environment, so the botanical, biological and geological, um, so looking at colours within nature, how um, certain plants produce certain colours, uh, what the geology is like, and then we can look at how humans uh, experiment with these um, aspects to create pigments and dyes. Then looking at also colour chemistry, so the assessment of how animals uh, negotiate colour to um, present different aspects, uh, such as warning, you know, mimicking. Um, we can also then look at um, outside sources, so what's, what's being brought to this colourscape? So people in archaeology trading flint, bringing, bringing a beautiful, everyone's been on a site where you've had this beautiful flint, like a bright red flint coming that's not natural, so bringing these colours within to the um, immediate landscape. Um, why is acknowledging colourscape important? Firstly, 
um, it's applicable to everywhere. It doesn't matter what period you're in, doesn't matter what site you're on, you can apply it to everywhere. You look and you basically take down all the different aspects of your site and can go, um, this is what people engaged with, this is why it's important, and people were engaging with colour in a daily life, whether it was recognised or not, is very much there. Um, we need to understand the, black and, the past is not black and white. Um, I don't know if any of you have spoken to, the, like, spoken to someone and you're going, oh, it's this fantastic site and they've got all these pits and blah, 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 and they're just looking at you just going, black and white, I don't know, I don't know. So it's, it's kind of um, bringing it on a multidisciplinary level. So taking it to um, different people in like the public, taking it to museums, different aspects. So not only archaeologists can understand it. Um, we want to really move past an anthropocentric view of the past. So I think uh, a problem with art is people always, oh, well, sorry, more specifically colour, people always see it as human creation. It's really not. It, it would exist without any human acknowledgement. Um, and we want to understand how art is accessible in the past and how people engaged and did this. So to begin with, colour and nature. You're all very aware that nature is colourful. So, <laughs> um, so colour is shared with all human, all things, living and non-living. Um, and it exists whether we acknowledge that it's there or not. So bringing about this uh, non-anthropocentric view again. Um, so Britain in 1983 wrote this very wonderful, very scientific uh, chemical analysis of colours. So it produces all these um, chemical equations of how uh, animals, insects, humans produce these colours. So it's this wonderful scientific um, look at how they are there within time and space and it doesn't matter whether we uh, um, engage with it or not um, and then looking at how aposmosis, uh, epismasis and pseudomasis um, is used by animals to uh, engage with colour. Um, so how do we, ex <laughs> I had to, <laughs> um, how do we perceive uh, colour? So. Once, as I would keep saying, colour exists without human engagement. So, um, colour, human colour vision is um, completely mm -hmm. different to all other mammals. Um, yes, animals can see colour, although it's a varying shades. So, um, we have three, three colour cones, which we can mm -hmm. identify red, green, and I think it's blue. And um, people who suffer from colour blindness have two cones, which they often get confused or they can't see certain, and very rarely one, and then animals have two. So um, this led me to think about colour within the past and how not everyone can see it exactly the same. So if you're looking at colour, we can go, oh yes, that's all well and grand, but then you're sat next to someone who can see colour completely different to you, and that's even before application of meaning and everything. So um, we really have to... Um, <laughs> we really have to acknowledge that things like colour blindness would be understood in the past and we can apply this to the work of you know Andy, Claire, Jill, everyone. We, we, we're looking at this art but how do individuals who suffer from things such as um, not being able to see certain colours, how did they um, engage with different types of art? So um, for my uh, masters I did a range of experimental work to produce um, colour swatches, so like a colour wheel of all the different um, sources that the immediate star car environment produced. Um, I was able to form pigments uh, and dyes from the natural sources. So here we have a birch bark dye and then a range of literally just from the peat and I did um, I used all these different resources which were available. Obviously there were a lot more in the environment, but um, due to time limits, I, I wasn't able to access them all. So I could uh, extract different colors from different things. And I'm not implying here that Mesolithic people did that. I'm not saying that at all, but I'm saying they could have done. They had the ability to do it. They had access to do it. They, had, they probably had the technology because it was very easy. <laughs> um, so all I did was experiment with burning, grinding, and boiling. 
So I used these different materials, and then I did an array of, um, so like a cobweb effect of um, mixing different ones to create different colours, different shades, and then starting to mix things like binding agents, so eggs, yolk, saliva, um, all these different things to assess the durability. So the, the things, the binding agents, they don't, uh, they don't affect the colour most generally, but if you then want to take these aspects to things like uh, applying to pottery, applying to the skin, then durability is a massive thing. Um, so this was uh, my colour chart results, and I'm very happy to talk over with it later. Um, it was uh, I was just looking at a Munsell kind of um, write-up of it all, and it was really interesting, actually. Um, I, it showed me that uh, burning aspects like um, hematite, it, it produces very, very little difference, um, but then such things like... Um, mixing it with peat it produces this like vastly darker color and um so moving swiftly on um how do colorscapes make us see art in the past because this, this session is about art so um we need to acknowledge that color exists without human or with, with without human or non-human experience it's just there. Whether you engage with it or not, it's um, a different thing. So what can it make us see? It then makes us think about things like the hidden past. So um, I'm sure a lot of you are um, quite clued up with the site of Star Car. I'm really sorry I couldn't get on the internet to put a, a map. Um, <laughs> so imagine it's there. Um, and something we don't have in the Mesolithic is uh, really access to things like portable art. Um, but they have all this wonderful variety of what, what Jill and um, Claire were talking about, what Andy was talking about, all this uh, ranges of art. Why does it stop in the Mesolithic? It, that doesn't make sense. And they have all this access to different pigments and dyes, so what were they doing? So this drew me onto thinking of ideas of portable art, things that don't survive, Things that are being used um, that may not survive, even in star car with anaerobic conditions, what could what could possibly be going on? So um, after doing some uh, ethnolinguistic um, investigations, uh, I don't know if any of you are informed, but Aboriginal traditional arts they often use things such as bark. Uh, bark is a fantastic form. It's um, it's easy to apply pigment and it's quite durable, but then it can also be discarded, it can also be used for um, kindling, all these different things. So it's very kind of in this fluid nature. Um, so what I did is I took my experimental pigment stuff and then applied them to things such as bark. Um, what did this look like? How did it change the color? How am I seeing things? How is this uh, applying it to like a physical record? So um, this is, I, I've only just started kind of going into this, so sorry, it's not in that much detail, but I did a, a micro experiment as well with how can we look at um, making tools of pigment portable, because you, you often think making pigment is just this powder, how would, unless you're storing it in some sort of like roll, barch roll pouch or something, which would be very messy, um, you can actually create these... Um, pigment crayons very easily and um, it's used from looking at uh, clay and just things like hematite and you just mix them and shape them and that becomes a very portable and quite durable artifact. Um, thanks. <laughs> this can then be wetted and then used as an actual crayon, used to paint, um, all this arrange of things and then let it dry and you can pock it away. However, something that is important to know is when it's submerged it completely goes back to the original consistency so it turns back to something that wouldn't be available in, uh, to see in the archaeological record. So I looked then at um, using other canvases. So if we can use bark, what else can we use? Um, antler, bone, fantastic. I've only used, uh, I want to make it clear, I've only used um, paper as just so we can see the colour, like obviously the people wouldn't have had wonderfully bleached white paper in the Mesolithic. Um, so when we think about more aspects of canvases, can we then begin to think of the body? So uh, ethno-linguistic uh, societies such as uh, the Himbaba tribe and Aboriginals, 
uh, use and engage with these pigments to um, create this uh, body modification. So um, the uh, pigment is used on the hair, dyeing the skin, um, but this is in a very uh, aesthetic way. But then when you look at the Aboriginals, um, when you ask them why, why they do it, it's a connection to the ground, to the earth, it's giving back. So we can look at all these different elements of meaning behind doing these things, but then also that things such as hair dye would be very, very easily accessible. Hematite was available within Mesolithic Star Car. Not saying people dyed their hair, but they could have. Um, these uh, middle pictures are also um, just experiments where we put it on our skin and how you can see even a green pigment is produced and that stayed on as well. Um, hematite stays on for ages and it stains everything so people if they were engaging with this would be covered. Um, to conclude, um, my point is colour makes everything in the world. We need to understand that it's there people would have, whether they understand that they are engaging with it or not, they did. Um, we need to translate this back to uh, looking at the archaeology. Colours often forgotten in the archaeological record. Um, people often talk about it in archaeolithic, within cave art, cave paintings, but then why can't we apply this to different periods? So, um, yeah, um, colourscapes, yay, they're great. <laughs> you should use them. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. <laughs>